Barack Obama may, may now admit there's a constitutional right to keep and bear arms, but when running for the United States Senate in 2004, he told the Chicago Tribune this, and I'm quoting him, quote, on the issue of prohibiting citizens from carrying concealed weapons, Obama said he believes national legislation should be passed to prevent other state laws from threatening the safety of Illinois residents. Pass a federal law to do away with a state law on concealed carry. He went on to say, quote, I am consistently on record and will continue to be on record as opposing concealed carry. Well, maybe Senator Obama will be just as consistently on the record as opposing you. Now, Barack Obama may now admit there's a individual right to bear arms in the Second Amendment, but when running for the United States Senate in 2004, the Chicago Tribune reported, quote, Obama proposes several gun control laws, including restricting purchases of weapons and ammunition at gun shows, establishing a national database that would capture and record imprints left by bullets, and making gun locks mandatory. Barack Obama may now admit there's an individual right to bear arms in the Second Amendment, but in 2005, he voted twice to hold manufacturer, distributors, dealers, and importers of firearms and ammunition liable for the acts of criminals. Barack Obama may now admit there's an individual right to bear arms in the Second Amendment, but just this April, he said, I am not in favor of concealed weapons. I think that creates a potential atmosphere where more innocent people could get shot during altercations, end quote. Barack Obama may admit there's an individual right to bear arms in the Second Amendment, but remember this, as the Supreme Court of the United States considers a vital issue, the Chicago Tribune reports, quote, Obama believes the D.C. handgun law is constitutional. The record shows that while Barack Obama may now admit that there is an individual right to bear arms in the Second Amendment, he would simply like to make it impossible for you to exercise that right. But we have news for you, Senator Obama. We don't view rights written and enshrined in the American Constitution like a cafeteria menu, with the government able to pick and choose the rights that allows us and the rights it denies us. We believe in the wisdom of the founders even more than the wisdom of a liberal senator from the south side of Chicago. Now, you cannot say there is a constitutional right and then do all you can to oppose the people exercising it and be speaking the truth to the American people. It is cynical, it is hypocritical, and it is wrong. Now, we know what Senator Obama will say when we raise his Second Amendment views. We know exactly what he's going to say. He will say it's divisive. He will say it's distracting. He will say it keeps us from coming together for all the important changes America wants. After all, he says, we are the change we have been waiting for. What the heck does that mean? Does it mean we've been keeping ourselves waiting? Does it mean that those who oppose change were on time, the courteous people? And, and why was change late anyway? I don't get it. Let me tell you what's divisive. It is divisive to undermine the Second Amendment. It is divisive to undermine the Constitution of the United States. It is divisive. It is divisive to say one thing and do another. It is divisive to belittle the values and the views and the deep-held respect of people for the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, which is exactly what Senator Obama was doing when he said what he did in San Francisco. And those of us here in Louisville have an answer to Senator Obama's core conviction that we must surrender our Second Amendment rights. Our answer is, no, we won't. Let me tell you, let me tell you what's distracting. 
It is distracting to say change when you have no experience of making real change. It is distracting to say you will bring Republicans and Democrats together when you have shown no ability and no interest in doing so in your time in the United States Senate. It is distracting to pretend you agree with someone when your actions and your words and your beliefs say otherwise. And it is distracting to say in a Democratic primary when you're trying to cozy up to moveon.org that an American flag on your lapel is, quote, a substitute for true patriotism, belittling all those who care to wear our country's flag, calling them false patriots. And then when you start focusing on the general election, like this week, start showing up with an American flag on your lapel again. That is what dis that's distracting. And what will keep us from uniting as a country is a politician with little experience, enormous ambition, and a voting record that puts him way out on the far fringe of his party. There is an individual right to keep and bear arms in the Second Amendment. And to protect it in this year's election, it will require individual action, your action. You know, politics has come a long way. We've got fancy television ads, we've got elaborate computer databases, we've got radio ads, we've got focus groups, we've got polls, and thanks to Al Gore, we've even got the internet. <laughs> but you know, the essence of American politics was written down in a short letter from the, by a lanky lawyer in Sangamon County, Illinois in 1840. He was chairman of the Whig campaign that year and he wrote a letter to his campaign committee. He said, make a perfect list of the voters, ascertain with certainty for whom they will vote, have the undecideds talked to by someone that they hold in confidence, and on election day, make certain that every Whig is brought to the polls. Now, Abraham Lincoln was a great president, maybe our greatest, but he was also a pretty good practical politician. And the most important thing in his four-step formula is number three, have the undecideds talked to by someone they hold in confidence. And for many people, this year, that's you. And to defend our Second Amendment rights this year, you must talk to those who hold you in confidence, your friends, your family, your neighbors, the people you work with and you worship with, you hunt with, people that look to you for guidance and your passion about the defense of the Second Amendment will make a difference in them registering to vote and voting and voting the right way. You know, we face a difficult political environment and a difficult political election. Victory in November is not going to be easy. But we are we're called on to rise when things are difficult. When things are easy, it's easy to sit back. But when the times are tough, it calls out the best in each of us. We need to ask when the task is challenging and the stakes are high, are high and make no mistake about it, in this election, the stakes are very, very high when it comes to the Constitution and the Second Amendment. A lot of important things hang in the balance, including profound matters of war and peace, jobs and economic prosperity, the shape of the Supreme Court, and the constitutional rights we have and want to continue to exercise. Nothing in politics is foreordained. I remember all those smart people who said, you know what, that young governor from Texas can't beat Al Gore. We're in a time of peace and prosperity. You can't win West Virginia. You can't win the election. I remember in 2004, the afternoon of the election, when all those smart people in the media had all those exit polls and they said, oh, Bush can't win. Kerry's going to win a big election. But the outcome of those two elections and the outcome of this election will be shaped by the same forces. The actions of free men and women casting their vote, working for causes in which they believe, and protecting rights that they cherish. We know what we stand to win and what we stand to lose in this election. So I ask you on behalf of our country and its future, on behalf of the values that we share, on behalf of the Constitution that we cherish, to do all you can to shape the outcome of this election, to stand for our values against those who would belittle them and to protect our rights against those who would diminish them. Thank you for your attention. 
my fellow clingers or Klingons or hunters or lovers of our Constitution, and may God continue to bless the mighty United States of America. Thank you.